Welcome to Law Uncharted, where we document, explore and uncover some of the world's most unexplained cold cases. While we all hope for answers when it comes to people who've had their lives taken from them too early, sometimes we're only left with questions. Today we'll be looking into the disturbing murders of Debbie Wolfe, Cindy Song, and unexplained execution of Matt Flores. As of this recording, sadly, all of these cases remain unsolved. The bizarre case of Debbie Wolfe, murder or accidental drowning. Debbie Wolfe, a practicing nurse at the time, vanished after leaving work at 4 p.m. on December 26, 1985. On the previous day, she had celebrated Christmas with her family. When she did not show up at work the next day, her family became concerned. Her parents, John and Jenny, and a friend, Kevin Gorton, went to her home, which was an isolated cabin seven miles outside of Fayetteville, North Carolina. With Debbie being particularly neat and meticulous, they were surprised at what they found in and around her home. Her car was parked in a different spot than usual, there were several beer cans scattered around the property, her dogs had not been fed, her uniform was thrown on the kitchen floor, and her purse was shoved under her bed. They also found a strange message on Debbie's answering machine. Hey Deb, Mitch here at work today. Uh, just wondering how you're doing. Uh, if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at date 227007. Or give me a call at home tonight. Uh, you've been out a lot of days. You made me worry when you miss another one. I just want to make sure you're okay. Bye. It was recorded earlier that day, with the caller claiming that she had been gone from work for several days. This was incorrect because she had been at work the day before. They searched the area surrounding a pond in Debbie's backyard, however no trace of her was found. When Jenny tried to report her missing, she was told that the police would not become involved until 72 hours had passed. On December 31st, five days after her disappearance, the sheriff's office finally began their investigation. Bloodhounds were used to search for Debbie's scent, but no trace of it was found. On the first day, a search of the pond was not done. On New Year's Day 1986, Jenny had two divers, Kevin Gorton and Gordon Childress, do so. Within just a few minutes, Gordon found two sets of footprints and drag marks at the bottom. He followed them until he came across Debbie's body. Strangely, it appeared that it had been placed in a burn barrel. Police were brought to the scene and took Debbie's body from the pond. An autopsy determined that there were no drugs or alcohol in her system. The cause of death was determined to be drowning. However, Kevin, who was involved with search and rescue, believed that her death was not consistent with drowning. According to him, normal drowning victims would have their eyes and mouths wide open, along with their arms and hands stretched out. However, her body was not found in this condition. Also, it appeared to be clean, despite the dirtiness of the pond. Police investigators believed that Debbie had died accidentally, falling into the pond while playing with her dogs. Her family and friends, however, did not believe this. They noted that the strongest piece of evidence was the fact that her body was found in a barrel. Surprisingly, the investigators claimed that there was no barrel at all. They believed that Kevin and Gordon had seen her jacket ballooned out from being in the water. A few months after Debbie's death, Jenny had a chance to examine the clothes found on her body. After looking at them, she became convinced that they did not belong to her. The pants appeared to be too large, the field jacket did not belong to her or her brother, the bra had a cup size that was three times too large for her, and the shoes were three sizes larger than her normal shoe size. However, the police claimed that the clothes belonged to her. Jenny believes that one of two volunteers from the hospital was responsible for Debbie's death, both had tried to pursue romantic relationships with her, and both apparently knew where she lived. Jenny believes that one of them took her hostage, kept her alive for several days, and then killed her. She believes that he returned later to remove the barrel from the pond, so that her death would appear to be accidental. 
To this day, her family remains convinced that she was murdered. At the hospital, Debbie was in charge of the volunteers. One particularly bothered her as he had a history of psychiatric illness and would often ask her to go out with him. At one point, he was able to get her home phone number and began to call her. He even claimed to know where she lived and threatened to come see her. After her body was found, he was questioned by the police. However, he had an alibi and refused to take a polygraph test. He left the state a few days later. The other volunteer tried to become romantically involved with Debbie in the weeks prior to her disappearance. However, she told him that she just wanted to be friends. Jenny believes that he was the suspicious caller on her answering machine. He was also questioned by the police. However, they found no evidence to suspect that he was involved. Sadly, the case remains unsolved. John, Jenny and Debbie's brothers John Jr. and Joseph have since passed away. The Cindy Song Cold Case What happened to the Halloween Bunny? Cindy Song grew up in South Korea. In 1995, she moved to Virginia to live with her aunt and uncle and to attend high school. After graduating, she went to Pennsylvania State University. On Halloween 2001, she, now a senior, went to a costume party at Players Nightclub with two close friends, Stacy Paik and Lisa Kim. She was dressed as a Playboy bunny. All three partied until 2 a.m. the next morning when they left and stopped off at a friend's apartment to play video games. At 4 a.m. they dropped Cindy off at her apartment. She was never seen again. A search of Cindy's apartment found no signs of a struggle or forced entry. The false eyelashes she had worn to the party were there, along with her backpack and cell phone. The only things that were missing were her purse that contained her driver's license and credit cards. Police believe she was wearing her Playboy Bunny costume when she vanished, as it was not found in her apartment. An analysis of her phone found that she had not made or received any calls after she was dropped off. There was also no activity on her credit cards. Finally, there was no suspicious activity on her emails. Police and volunteers searched a wooded area near the campus. However, no trace of Cindy was found. Authorities don't believe that she ran off on her own. Two Britney Spears concert tickets were found in her apartment. A printout for a computer that was due to be received on November 6th was also found. Her friends and relatives don't believe that she was the type of person to just disappear. They also did not believe she was depressed or wanting to end her life. Her friends remembered that she was happy and upbeat on the night she vanished. Authorities believe that Cindy left her apartment to go to a 24-hour supermarket and that she was abducted there or on the way. Another theory was that she left her apartment with someone that she knew and then was killed by them. A few days after she disappeared, a woman matching her description was seen in Philadelphia being forced into a car by an unidentified man. Police do not know who he was or if the woman was her, but they would like to question him. A $27,000 reward was made available for this case. Police did investigate the possible suspect who was seen trying to force a woman matching Cindy's description into a car. She was screaming, crying for help, and he yelled at the witness to leave. The incident occurred in Philadelphia's Chinatown district, 200 miles from her apartment. He is wanted only for questioning and is described as an Asian male with olive to light brown complexion and medium length hair. He has never been identified. In 2003, police connected Cindy's disappearance to a bank robber and suspected serial killer named Hugo Selensky. A co-defendant of his told police that he and an accomplice, Michael Kurkowski, had abducted and killed a woman from State College that matched Cindy's description. The informant led police to the location of five bodies on Selensky's property, however DNA testing proved that none were Cindy's. One of them was Kurkowski. The informant claimed that Cindy was buried on another part of the property. Authorities believe the informant is telling the truth because his information on the other five cases turned out to be correct. Selensky also confessed to kidnapping Cindy, but claimed that Kurkowski killed her 
and kept her bunny ears as a souvenir. Surprisingly, in 2006, he was acquitted of the murders of two drug dealers who were found on his property. He was, however, convicted of abusing their bodies. In January 2014, authorities announced that the badly destroyed remains of seven other people were found on Selensky's property. They have looked into the possibility that one of the sets belongs to Cindy. However, she has not yet been linked to them. They also announced that Selensky's attorney and a private investigator were involved in witness intimidation and other crimes relating to his case. Finally, in 2015, he was convicted of the murders of Kurkowski and his girlfriend, Tammy Fassett, who were also found on his property. He was sentenced to life in prison. He is still considered a suspect in this case, however, her body has never been found. Unfortunately, as of the date of recording, this case still remains unsolved. The seemingly motiveless 1994 murder of Matt Flores 26-year-old Matt Flores was a successful military officer starting a job at Applied Materials Inc. in the Silicon Valley. He was married to his wife of four years, Denise, and had a newborn daughter, Danielle. On March 24, 1994, on his ninth day at his new job, he arrived at work at around 8.12 a.m. and parked his car, a white Chevy Corsica that his bosses had rented for him. He was then murdered execution-style by an unknown party as he got out of his car. He was found by a woman sitting in a car nearby. Amazingly, despite a total of 20 people in the parking lot at the time, not one single person saw his killer. Authorities found that Matt had no known enemies, and no reason to have been killed. Police were at a standstill when they learned that his murder occurred in a security camera's blind spot. However, the security footage did give police their most significant lead. The footage shows an unidentified two-door Ford Explorer entering the parking lot 20 minutes before the shooting. Seconds later, a two-door Ford probe, similar to Matt's, was followed by the Explorer. The Explorer exited the parking lot a few minutes later. Three minutes before the shooting, the Explorer re-entered the parking lot and went in the direction of where the shooting occurred. At 8.12 a.m., two minutes before the shooting, Matt and the female eyewitness entered the parking lot. At 8.14 a.m., the shooting takes place, just out of camera range. Approximately 20 seconds later, the Explorer left the parking lot, never to be seen again. Investigators believe, based on the tape, that the killer was stalking Matt that morning. They believe that he was a victim of mistaken identity, and that the killer was planning on killing a man driving the same type of car Matt was driving. The killer has never been identified, and Matt's case remains unsolved. A $100,000 reward was offered for information that helps solve the case. They have also looked into several theories, including that he was killed as a result of a road rage incident, that his murder was related to the military and his job. They looked into the possibility that it was related to that of Sergeant Nicholas Gange, who served under Matt while in the military. He mysteriously vanished in April 1993 and was later found dead under suspicious circumstances. However, no evidence has been found to substantiate these theories. Investigators are still actively looking into Matt's case and have tried to give it more publicity. However, they have received few new leads. As such, this case remains unsolved. The inexplicable nature of these cases leaves us haunted by the unknown. All we can do is hope that eventually the families are able to receive closure on what really happened. If you enjoyed this video, we'd greatly appreciate if you could hit the thumbs up. Remember to subscribe for more videos on The Unanswered. Join us as we continue to bring forth the cases that linger in the shadows. Thank you for delving into the mysteries with us, and until next time, may the truth reveal itself in the most unexpected ways.